All right. Well, uh, thank you. Thanks to the organizers. Um, we'll thank them again later. Uh, I, I, did, I did find it interesting that Al opened up that uh, by describing this as Mark designed 25 years later. Yeah. <laughs> she is. Um, as near as I remember, uh, you know, we, we began our work, uh, Al and I both were doing our work in 93-94, um, the, uh, the law authorizing the spectrum auctions, which uh, I worked on, was uh, passed in 1993, and we got the auctions uh, uh, going in 1994, and Al was working on the National Resident Matching Program in the same period. Where are you, Al? Back there somewhere. That's when you did your work, right? So this, so, so this seemed like. In fact, the organizers, when they invited me, said, "You know, well, this is going to be in Washington D.C. It's like 30 years after the Spectrum auctions, and 30 years anyway. So, 30 years. I'm going. I'm going with 30 years. Um, and so, and, and uh, Mark of Sing was really, you know. What, if you consider this the beginning, and Al and I taught a class at Harvard in, in 2000, where um, actually, Parag, you were a student in that class? And Michael was. And Michael was too, okay, the, uh, when we first uh, taught the first market design class um, at Harvard. And back then, it was a class on matching and auctions. Um, and, you know, there was some auction stuff going on in uh, Spectrum Auctions. National Resident Matching Program. Uh, we had uh, school choice hadn't happened yet. Kidney exchange um, hadn't happened yet, and, uh, and and this is where we started. And then you know now, uh, holy cow! Um, I was trying to. I'm I'm teaching. You know, I teach an undergraduate class in market design, and I said, so what's the discipline here? What is the com look at this list? What's the commonality among the uh, items on this list? Apart from the fact that we're all concerned about making something happen in the real world, there's just such heterogeneity uh, uh, down this list. Uh, you know, uh, uh, when we're doing electricity, everything from, well, everything from traditional IO topics to computational complexity, as um, Martin Bickler was telling us about. And I would mean, just look at the things that come up when we do organ transplant. Market design was, we're interested in the organ procurement organizations and replacing them. Is that what market design is about? Uh, is it about, you, you just heard what, what comes up in AI. So uh, I'm trying to figure out um, how I should update my undergraduate market design class and trying to find some themes here. If anybody sees themes here, please tell me about it. Because uh, uh, apart from the fact that we care about resource allocation, and we now know that markets don't organize themselves. It's not just a matter of there's a supply curve and a demand curve, and transactions take place at a given price. There are lots of details, and and I think the one of the other big things is is that is that the details vary. It, it, one of the, as you go down these things, the important details which you have to get right seems to be different in um, each of these settings, and I think that is one of the one of the big and important lessons of of uh, uh, of market design of practical market design that we've learned from experience and and that theory is is often very useful in in helping us make progress and i'm not going to go back over all these things because uh, that's what the whole new directions conference was about instead i'm going to tell you about one more um something that uh, has been of interest to me just uh, in the last year and water um now you might have thought if you're new to this that water is the obvious you know homogeneous divisible commodity that uh what is there to say about water but you'd be quite wrong uh if if that's what you think and i'm going to tell you about it um, in a moment here i want to emphasize first of all that the the person who really brought this together and did most of the work is billy ferguson who's a graduate student at Stanford, and, and uh, I don't want to steal any of Billy's thunder. He's responsible for uh, most of what we're doing. But we really want to solve the water problem. My co-PI on this, uh, on the project, which is funded by the the Door School, uh, the Sustainability School at Stanford, um, is Buzz Thompson. Buzz was, was the head of the Woods Institute, the Environmental Institute at Stanford, and is a lawyer by training. He teaches water law um at stanford and water law is extremely complicated as you'll see in uh, uh in a few moments so uh those are the people that i'm working on water with and um 
I just, just as a general opening, water is a problem worldwide. Four billion people in the world face uh, severe water scarcity at least one month a year. Uh, global water demand is expected to increase by 20 to 30 cent, uh, percent, while water availability is decreasing. And there's uh, 700 million people expected to be displaced by 2030 because of intense water scarcity. So, uh, so water is a huge problem. I, we're starting for ourselves. We decided to start with water in California, which is enough of a problem. Um, oh, by the way, solutions uh, historically, the, uh, the what water policy has been about is supply augmentation. You know, you divert a stream or you build a dam or 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 perhaps build a desalination plant to uh, to add to the water supply. That's most of what uh, water policy has been about. Water markets have not been very important around the world. Um, there's an active water market in Australia, which I may refer to in the Murray-Darling Basin, which I may refer to a little more uh, soon. But, um, uh, but water markets uh, help us use a scarce resource and direct it to its most valuable use. So you might wonder, why don't we have, what, what do we need market design for and anytime I, I hope one of the lessons, if there's any lesson that came up at all uh, during the course of the of the seminar here, is that when you get into the details, there's <laughs> there's something there that that's specific to the uh, application that you're looking at. So, uh, by the way, Mark Twain commented yeah. on this <laughs> long ago: "Whiskey is for drinking, water is for fighting over." So, um, so that's what Mark Twain had to say. Um, so in, we are going in the in the Western United States through the worst mega drought in more than a thousand years. Um, before this year, we we fortunately just had a nice rainy winter, very rainy winter in California. But the, the uh, uh, this is you're looking at a reservoir uh, as of last year. Um, all of that's supposed to be full of water, as you can tell, and the boats are stuck in a little mud pond over here that was all that's left from uh, this is Lake Oroville. Um, fortunately, with the rains, these reservoirs in California, uh, the California reservoirs are refilling. But um, but there continues to be uh, big problems. The Colorado River, which is one of the major sources of water on the West, gets about uh, 12 million acre feet of flow every year. And it ha there's about 17 million acre feet of commitments. and um, the obvious imbalance and, and the government has been meeting those commitments mostly by drawing down the big reservoirs behind the the, uh, the at Lake Mead behind the Hoover Dam and Lake Powell behind the Glen Canyon Dam, which had massive, when they were full, they had 52 million acre feet of storage. Um, remember this is, uh, they're on the Colorado River, which has a 12 million uh, annual acre foot flow. So massive amounts of storage which have been drawn down and are almost gone. And uh, just before this conference, this is from April 23rd, the uh, federal government uh, uh, issued their near-term Colorado River Operations uh, uh, Supplemental Environmental Impact Statement, uh, which included this uh, the potential impact of low runoff conditions uh, in the remainder of the, this period pose unacceptable risk to the routine operations of the Glen Canyon and, and uh, Hoover Dams, and therefore moderated operate, operating uh, guidelines need to be expeditiously developed. So we're expecting there will be change. We, we began work on this because we thought there was a crisis approaching and we wanted to have a plan in, in place uh, so that when the government was finally ready to do something, we would have, we would have a plan in place and uh, it, things are moving very fast. It's, uh, or I can tell you about that. Okay, so why uh, why is there a problem with water? It's perfectly homogeneous, divisible commodity. Well, um, I'm going to talk mostly about surface water first. Uh, we distinguish uh, surface water and groundwater. Surface water is the stuff that flows through the, down the, through the rivers, and groundwater you draw out of underground aquifers that were uh, most of which was deposited long ago by melting glaciers and such. Um, and uh, the, the problem can be explained by classical economic issues, uh, externalities from trade. I'll show you exactly how that arises. Diverse and outdated uh, property rights. There's no uniform rights that 
for which a, a nice market price uh, exists that provides good signals uh, to value, difficulties of accurate and accessible measurement of usage and externalities, and, and thin markets due to inadequate information. So, uh, you know, these are traditional problems. So what kind of externalities are there from trading water? Well, here's a, a, an area outside Sacramento, California, just to give you an example of uh, water rights and the hydrological situation. So if you look here, uh, the red dots on this picture, let's see if I can point, well, anyway, that I'm, I'm at a funny angle, but the red dots on this picture indicate the uh, location of farmers who own uh, rights to draw water from these um, uh, surface water. And the green arrows on the picture uh, denote uh, diversions. So there's a location, for example, up here, where uh, water is diverted from the river to, uh, to these three uh, major users. And um, uh, from the streams are in blue, the canals are in, uh, uh, in red. And the red arrows indicate return flows from the streams back, back into the streams and canals. What are return flows? And this is the essence of what makes this so hard. Uh, if you put uh, 100 acre feet of, of, uh, of flood irrigation on a field, some of that uh, evaporates, some of it transpires, that is it goes into your plants and gets used, and some of it goes down into the ground where it either flows back into a uh, uh, a stream or uh, gets added to an aquifer that um, uh, that it, it's going down um, into. And uh, uh, you'll see that why that's important in a moment here, but the users may return water to the original stream or the, the, the diversion may go into a different stream. Something happened? Yeah. Okay, so, so let's take a look at how this uh, works in terms of externalities. This is a simplified example of billies. We have uh, two streams here, each with uh, uh, 40 acre feet uh, flowing down uh, through them. And uh, uh, Alice and Bob and Charlie each have rights to draw from the stream. Uh, Alice has a right to draw 25 acre feet, Bob 20 acre feet, Charlie 45 acre feet. And you can see that uh, those things don't add up, that there are, there's only 40 acre feet in the flowing down the river on the left and, and 40 acre feet uh, on the stream on the right. And, there, and there's 45 acre feet of, of, um, of diversion rights there. But um, it turns out that Bob's evapotranspiration, the water that gets evaporated or used up is, is uh, just half of the 20, it's 10 acre feet. And as a consequence, uh, five acre feet flows back after Bob uses it into the stream on the left and five acre feet flows into the stream on the right. And that leaves just enough uh, flow for Alice and, and Charlie to, uh, to get uh, what, uh, to have their rights filled, okay? Now, um, so this is a hydrological network. Uh, users may return water to the original stream uh, or to other streams uh, in, the, uh, in, in the network, okay? So let's take a look at what this means about trade. Suppose that Alice has a higher marginal value of water than Bob and wants to buy um, eight acre feet of rights from him. So uh, there's eight acre feet. I've just added that arrow uh, uh, that, uh, that Bob is going to sell to Alice. And what that's going to do, since Bob is using only 12 acre feet, and since he returns half of it, the return flows uh, are, are going to be three acre feet into the stream on the left and three acre feet into the stream um, on the right. And uh, Alice is now able to divert uh, 31 acre feet. Um, 12 is taken out, three is, is returned. Uh, add that to the 40 and you get 31 acre feet available to Alice now. Uh, but Charlie only gets 43 acre feet and he had a right to 45. Um, so there's an externality from this trade. Um, Charlie, who had a right to 45 acre feet, is only getting 43 acre feet as a result of the trade between uh, Bob and Alice. And in California, this is illegal. Um, the uh, Charlie can say, wait a minute, uh, 
<laughs> they can't do that. They're taking um, water molecules that belong to me, and um, and this trade is uh, is legally blocked. Now things aren't as clean as this. In this uh, example that I've given you, people know what the return flows are. They know what the usages are. All of this is as if measured. And you, you might ask yourself, why don't they just bring Charlie into the deal? And if they knew how many acre feet uh, Charlie was uh, was was suffering uh, as a as a loss, that uh, that might be possible. Um, but part of the problem here is this all ends up being litigated. Charlie hires a hydrologist that says, no, 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 I actually lost four acre feet and goes to court with this, his hydrologist. And Bob and Alice hire their hydrologist and say, no, you're wrong. And uh, we have a mess. So uh, California just bans these trades. OK. <laughs> and the California Supreme Court had this to say about it. It says that the, the scope and technical complexity of issues concerning water resources management are unequaled by virtually any other type of activity presented to the courts. <laughs> so the, the hydrology is complicated. And um, I mean, again, we start with, when you first hear about it, water, the visible homogeneous, right? But it's not, it's, uh, it's very complicated. The, uh, the which, exactly who's affected by which flows is, is very complicated. And you can imagine that if what was going on on the previous slide is that uh, Bob was uh, trying to sell his water to Los Angeles, um, and he's got uh, uh, the, the water that he withdraws, then both Alice and Charlie are losing, um, are, are losing return flow. And Alice and Charlie are both uh, objecting to the ship, shipment of that water through, through a pipe to, uh, to a city. So these are these are quite complicated um, transactions. Okay, so I, what we've been up to uh, now, I'm not the first one to say this, and and uh, the we have lots of people at Door School who, uh, the engineers and so on, who, who know a whole lot more about hydrology and water flows than I do, um, and uh, so you you might wonder what what role uh, I have as a market designer. Well, part of the role that I have have as a market designer part of it is talking about uh, what the endpoint should be but another part of it is talking about the transition and uh, uh, Kevin Leighton Brown was up here a little while ago where are you Kevin somewhere back there hi Kevin um, who did brilliant work in the incentive auction by the way thank you Kevin for making that a, that project a success um, the uh, what we did in the incentive auction part of what we did was change one kind of right to another we were buying television broadcast rights, making some changes to the system and selling mobile broadband rights, which are sold, uh, which are different. Uh, they, they involve different interference restrictions. They have, have uh, different needs. They're cut up into different geographic areas, different frequency bandwidths. They differ in a lot of ways from the underlying, uh, uh, fr from the previously existing rights. And part of what we want to do in this system is to uh, homogenize the rights to replace the old rights with new rights that will be tradable. And any economist will tell you why that would be a good idea if it could be brought about. But part of the reason it, it's so hard to bring about is that the uh, these rights, they're property rights, they're constitutionally protected. You can't go in and tell a farmer, you're gonna have to trade off your, your, your old right uh, for a new right. Farmer can just say no. And uh, it's a property right, and you can't do anything about that. So uh, the question of how we get to uh, uniform rights that are tradable, um, well, the, the, the concept that I was taking from the incentive auction is we don't need all of it. Uh, just as we didn't need every television uh, broadcaster to go off the air, we don't need every farmer to trade his old, old rights for new rights in, in order to create an effective uh, market. And so uh, stepping toward reform, there's a lot of steps, and these are big steps. I don't mean to make this sound trivial, but if we can do something voluntary, as we did in the incentive auction, so that nobody is forced to change their rights, uh, so that you know it's an actual Pareto improvement uh, that, that we bring about, that should make it politically much more palatable than something where we somehow try to take away constitutionally protected rights or even 
rights where the farm lobby is pretty strong, even just uh, just in that way. So um, one of the things we need to do, uh, turns out uh, another complication that we have is the rights that you might think belong to the farmers don't always belong to the farmers. They sometimes belong to the irrigation district. So in the, in the Imperial Valley in Southern California, the Imperial Irrigation District it's a huge user of water. In fact, 25% of the flow that's allocated from the Colorado River goes to the Imperial Irrigation District in Southern California, which has a very high priority uh, water right. And uh, it has no incentive to see, you know, the, these guys are uh, politicians who are not allowed to spend the money on anything interesting. They can, they can generate power, which is virtually free down there anyway, or they can build canals and that's all they can. You know, they don't want to be paid to sell water rights, but the farmers, um, many of them we know would be happy to sell their rights. We want to force the, um, the irrigation districts to, uh, uh, to distribute the rights to the users to, uh, as a step toward making these things um, uh, tradable. And I'll tell you a little bit more if I have time about how we want to do that. Um, second, in order for there to be trade, we got to know who owns what. We need a public database of, of surface water property rights. We don't even have that right now. This was uh, this all emerged out of historical use in California. It all started in 1849 with the gold rush when water was being used to blast mountains to try to bring get out gold ore. And we have this had this first in use, uh, first in right system. Um, anybody who was using water then had first priority over people who came to use water later nobody has records of all this stuff and the uh, and we don't have a complete record that needs to be done um the we need uh, in, what one of the first things we did in, in the incentive auction even before any of the things that kevin described to you is the federal communications commission um uh ran its interference study where it said you know which broadcasters were interfering with each other? If Parag was on uh, uh, channel uh, 22 and, and Mike was on channel 23, would there be interference between them or not? And, and uh, that was done and it became the basis for this is what constitutes unacceptable interference. We need to know what's um, unacceptable, uh, what unacceptable trades are. We need to prepare and maintain uh, a legally approved uh, hydrological model, we need a study done that will uh, fix those constraints so we know what they are, so that not every trade is being litigated. Um, we need to adopt and recognize measures of consumptive use. Now, how much water is actually being used when, when Mike takes, you know, 20 acre feet and uses it on his land? Now, once upon a time, we were unable to measure that. It turns out today there are new technologies. We have uh, OpenET is a, a website that you can go to uh, where you can look at a map of the Western United States and tell acre by acre how much water is leaving the land and going up into the air. That evapotranspir uh, transpiration from each acre of land, we can actually tell what the use is. And, um, and, and so measurement has become possible and we need to have a recognized measure, which is uh, legally understood to be an accurate measure of, uh, of use. Uh, we need to offer voluntary conversion. Now here's the, here's the essence of, of the uh, change we want to bring about for economic reasons. We want to re replace these old rights, which were the, which every, every farmer had a different right to, take a certain amount of water from a certain stream if there's sufficient water there, uh, where, you know, if, if Parag got his uh, rights before Irene, then uh, then if there's a shortage of water, he gets all of his water before she got any of hers. We need to homogenize those things so that these rights are, are uh, within categories, at least, are all the same, so that there's a market price and so that uh, if uh, Parag now sells his rights, uh, for a price of two hundred dollars an, uh, an acre foot, Irene will know that the price of water or water is two hundred dollars an acre foot, and we will uh, will have price signals that are guiding use and um, and, and uh, uh, that are guiding use. And uh, we need to do this carefully, however, because uh, some farmers right now in California, if you did that, they would say, "Fine, 
I will sell my water rights, but I will pump groundwater out of the aquifer underneath what we call uh, groundwater substitution. Um, California is in the midst of, uh, it has the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. It's in the midst of setting up um, uh, groundwater regulation and it, only in areas where regulation, where that regulation is in place, does this make any sense. We also want these rights, these rights would be secure, not use it or lose it rights, so that you could uh, you could sell your rights one year when there's uh, not enough rain, so water, uh, so Los Angeles gets enough water, and then use them again the next year. And we'd also like if it was a really rainy year, and um, I had, uh, more water than I needed for the plants I was growing. I'd, I'd like to be able to tell the federal government, keep it in the reservoir. I'll use it in a dry year. Uh, right now, you can't do that. If you don't use the water, you lose the right. And it just seems so sensible. And in addition, by the way, once these rights of once you have marketable water, if you want to do uh, uh, water saving projects and you need to invest in a drip irrigation system or whatever, these rights, once they're, you can use them as security for a loan because they're marketable. There's so many benefits that come from um, for making these things marketable. Now, uh, we have some ideas in mind about how to, what kind of offers to make where we would swap your old rights for your new rights. But in order to uh, ensure that we got enough of these things going, we're imagining a procurement auction in which uh, to launch the system the government has a fix up a sum of money to, to spend. It's trying to encourage at least 50% of the rights to be switched from the old rights to the new rights. And it's a descending clock auction, very similar to what we did uh, for, the, uh, for the FCC, where we will pay the farmers initially, the, the, first, uh, the first users who agree to sell, to swap their rights from the, uh, from the old kind of right to the new kind of right. In addition, the new kind of right has, is more secure. New kind of right is something they can store. New kind of right is something they can borrow against. We think this would be pretty attractive for them, and we might be able to do this at very low cost uh, to get uh, to get a good initial um, uh, initial conversion going to uh, to launch the system, and um, and then finally for to to pull some of these rights out of places like the Imperial Irrigation District. I told you that one of the things we need to do is, is get farmers who are growing alfalfa, which has very low value and using lots of water to be, to be happy to uh, sell that. Well, there are farmers who would do that, but they can't sell it because they don't control their own water. So um, the, it turns out that in California law, the, um, your right to use water uh, uh, is contingent. Remember, there's a it's a use it or lose it right, and uh, you have to put the water to a beneficial use to keep the right. And the California Supreme Court recently ruled that uh, the definition of beneficial use can change over time, um, which is great, right? Because we would then propose that uh, the legal definition of beneficial use is. If you have a use that's worth whose economic value is less than half the market price, it doesn't qualify as a beneficial use. This would force the uh, some of these government agencies that are wasting water uh, to find ways to, 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 you know, the farmers would say, give us the water, we'll sell it, you know, the, uh, would, would find a way to help move the resource to its uh, more valuable use. Okay, um, I'm down to my last minute and I, I want to do what I think several people have already done, which is, oops, conclusion. Uh, current Western mega, mega drought highlights how climate change is going to continue to disrupt, disrupt water resource allocations. Australia has an active water market, which I didn't have a chance to talk about, that uh, is, uh, has been shown to, to uh, combat the problem of scarcity from climate change when there is, uh, when they have low water years, the water, uh, trades a lot. Um, the successful U.S. incentive auction is a model for some of the steps to uh, restructuring rights to build the well-functioning uh, water market. And uh, for Irene and Mike and Parag, we salute you. Thank you all very much for a wonderful time, Charles.